Well, hello everyone. My name is Greg Dunn, and I'm the greenhouse manager for Trillium Haven Farm, which is a community-supported agriculture farm just outside of town in Jenison, Michigan. Uh, I'm the greenhouse manager there. I try and keep all of our plants healthy and alive and on schedule and also manage our seedling line that we uh, sell at the Fulton Street Farmers Market. We're there every Saturday morning and we'll be there through Father's Day with uh, three inch pots of seedlings. I want to thank Sarah for inviting me back again. I was here a month ago and we talked about getting started, what vegetables we can plant out in the garden in early to mid spring. And then she said that uh, for this next class, she'd like me to talk about, give you all the information you need to get you through the rest of the season. And that is a big subject. So what I thought I'd do is talk about just two plants and we can extrapolate the growing methods from these, from these individual plants to other plants. You'll be doing the same kinds of things with other plants, but we'll just focus on tomato and basil for right now. The farm I work at is uh, we use organic methods and practices, and I use organic methods and practices in my home garden, and so I'll be focusing on those kinds of methods for you. Uh, organic gardening is nothing to be afraid of if you've never done it before. Uh, it's very easy. Organic gardening is the way people have been gardening for as long as there has been gardens uh, up until very recently. So it's a very traditional way of gardening. Since there's so many different things I could talk about and so many different vegetables and they each have different growing conditions, and different plants, uh, pests, and diseases, it's important uh, to have a good reference guide. Often you'll have a question and the best way to answer that question is to, is to look it up in a, in a nice reference book. One I like a lot is the Gardener's A to Z Guide to Growing Organic Food, uh, which is a great basic introduction. It has general information on organic gardening, and then it goes through each individual crop. Snap beans here, for example, and we'll talk to you about, it'll walk you through soil and water needs, pests and diseases that they are prone to, allies, plants that you can grow them with for companion planting. It'll recommend varieties in some cases. Uh, it's a lot of information in a small space, and if you really want to go more deeply in your gardening, uh, a, good, a good guidebook and roadmap is always helpful. So planting. For tomatoes and basil, they're very warm season crops, and so we need to wait in West Michigan to plant these until after the threat of frost has passed. For most of us in most of West Michigan, that date is going to be Memorial Day weekend. Sometimes you can push it forward a little bit. Uh, if you live in town, for example, uh, I get about a week added on to the growing season because in town you have the urban heat island effect and temperatures simply are warmer. Uh, in town than they are out in the country. If you live, if your garden is on a high spot, uh, you will have frost. Your last frost will be earlier because cold sinks. If you live in a low spot, if your garden is in a low-lying area, your frost state may be later in the season because the cool will pool in the low spots in your garden. But as a rough rule of thumb, Memorial Day is the date when you can safely plant out tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, basil, annual herbs. It's when you can direct sow uh, pole beans and bush beans and many, many other vegetables. The other thing to consider when planting warm season vegetables is the overnight temperature. And for things like tomatoes and peppers, you want your overnight temperature to not fall below 50 degrees. When that happens, and this, peppers are especially prone to this, it won't kill the plant, but they will slow down and in some cases stop growing completely. So if you plant out peppers and the temperature gets below 50 degrees, they'll stop and they will take a week to recover and it just slows down your garden schedule. So again, Memorial Day is a pretty good rule of thumb. You can keep an eye on the weather and if you see, if you plant something out, and if you see on the weather that overnight temperatures are going to drop below 50, you can cover your plants for the night. Uh, you can cover them with a bed sheet, with a bucket, with uh, 
two liter pop bottle with the top cut off to make a little, little mini greenhouse. You just have to remember to remove that in the morning because once the sun comes out, it'll get really hot under that covering and cook your plants. So, so we're looking for that 50 degree temperature overnight to begin planting out. For things like tomatoes and peppers, you will either want to buy transplants or start seedlings indoor roughly six weeks before the date you're going to plant out. And the reason for that is not only do we have to keep an eye on the last frost date in the spring, we also have to keep an eye on the first frost date in the fall because that will constitute our growing season. And if you read a seed packet or if you read a plant label, it'll say something like 95 days to maturity. But that 95 days is how long it's going to take for that plant to bear a crop. And you want the plant to be able to set fruit, ripen, and harvest before it's killed by the frost. And 95 days is pushing it around here. So if you start your plant indoors, you gain six weeks. Things like winter squash uh, often needs to be started indoors because it has a long growing season. Many of the heirloom varieties of tomatoes are 100, 110 days till maturity. Uh, and you want to start those inside. Starting inside is fairly straightforward, but it's also kind of a whole other thing. Um, and I won't be covering it here. So you may want to think about buy, just simply buying your plants from a nursery. And when you're buying plants, I want to encourage you to buy plants from a reputable, responsible, and local, local grower. And I say that not only because I am a responsible, reputable local grower. I hope I'm responsible and reputable. You go to the city market? Uh, the Fulton Street Farmer's Market is a great place to find plants. Right. Uh, local nurseries are great places to find plants. Sort of home centers and big box stores are less good. And nothing against those stores or the people who work there. But oftentimes, they're not as experienced in vegetable culture as you will find at the farmer's market or at nurseries. And so their plants may not be as healthy as you would like them to be. A point in case is two years ago, if any of you grew tomatoes, you may have remembered the late blight, or even if you ate tomatoes, the late blight from two years ago. Late blight is a disease that strikes tomatoes late in the season, uh, is passed through spores, uh, attacks the plant quickly, ruins the fruit, kills the plant, and you know in a week you're done. It's really sad when that happens, and it was really sad when it happened then. And one theory as to how the late blight spread so quickly was that it came through uh, a couple big nurseries that delivered to home centers, and then from home centers were distributed throughout the nation, and the folks at the home centers didn't catch it. So you're less likely, that's less likely to happen, I feel, with an with a experienced vegetable grower. So planting out. You've gotten your plants from a local responsible, reputable grower. It's Memorial Day weekend, and you're ready to plant out. You've prepared your garden bed. You have a nice, loose soil. Uh, maybe you've amended it with some compost or some well-composted animal manure and you're ready to plant. How do you do that? It's as easy as dig a hole in the soil. You can use a, use a trowel is a great tool. You can use a soil knife is a great tool. Um, a soil knife is really handy to have for weeding. If you have perennials you need to divide, it's got a serrated blade that you can, you can hack away at things if you need to Defend your garden from banditos, it's handy. Uh, <laughs> and you uh, make a hole, and then in that hole, put in, say, a handful of compost, or another great product is fish emulsion. Fish emulsion is a fish and seaweed product, byproduct, uh, that you dilute in water and use that to fertilize with. Great organic matter, has lots of micronutrients, has lots of bio, little biological life to improve the microbial life in your soil. 
you know, you might put a little dollop of that in your hole. You take your pot, take the tag out, save that for later. I'll do this here over my paper. Just sort of gently squeeze and tap the pot. And it comes right out. Now, when you look at the root ball, you want to you want to pay attention to this a little bit. If the plant has been sitting in the pot for a while, if it's if it's getting a little a little aged, there'll be a large root ball and sometimes it'll form a dense mat around the edge of the pot. Before planting that, you want to break apart those roots. Even with this one, you might want to tease apart the roots a little bit. If it's a real thick mat, you, you want to just even tear into that. Uh, you might even want to use a soil knife and sort of slice off that, uh, that dense root mat. Because what will happen if you don't do that, when you plant it, the roots will just keep spiraling around. They won't push out into the surrounding soil. You won't get a deep root structure. You'll have trouble keeping these plants alive during dry spells because the roots will be very shallow. They won't grow as well because they're not drawing up as much nutrients or organic matter from the soil. So you want to pay a little bit of attention to the root bowl. This one's pretty nice. I think I would just pop that one right in the soil. And for almost everything you plant in the soil, you want the level of your garden soil to be just above the level of the pot, of the, of the, of the soil in the pot. So if this is your soil, you want your pot to be like that, just right at or just below. There's your plant. And when you fill it, you fill in, you know, fill in around, gently tamp the soil in, and the level of the soil can be just above the top of the, of the root ball here. If you plant the plant too high, if your plant's sitting way up here, you run the risk of this drying out too quickly. If you plant it too deeply, you run the risk of the stem of the plant rotting off. So you just kind of want it right there. Gently push it in. Don't pack it in. Don't make it dense and compact because that will make it more difficult for the roots to push out into the soil. And then once you've done that, gently water it in, we call it. You know, sort of take your watering can with a gentle rose or your hose with a nice gentle spray and just sort of water it in and let the water settle the soil. And then you're done. Move on to the next hole. Tomatoes, I want to say, are an exception to this rule. Tomatoes are interesting in that they will set off roots anywhere along this stem. If you put up a tomato and it falls out of its trellis and lies on the ground, it will actually root in all along here and just grow straight into the ground. It's a crazy plant. We've even, at the farm, we've even, you know, taken cuttings and cut this off and stuck it in a thing of soil and in as little as a week, it'll send roots out from this stem. So tomatoes you can plant, that, what that means is tomatoes can be planted more deeply and that's a benefit to it. You know, you could come up as deep as this. You could pinch off all the, all the branches below, put it deep in a soil, and what that will do is help it develop an even denser root system because it's growing roots down here from the root ball, it's shooting roots out from the top, and you're going to get, again, that great root structure that's going to drop water, that's going to drop nutrients, and is going to give you a healthy, happy tomato plant. I would do that, if you want to do that, I would do that a month before you want to plant out. It takes a little while to recover. To, just to give it time to create that good root structure in the pot before you plant it out. Is that done regularly with tomatoes? Not too regularly. Oh, okay. There are some growers who are experimenting with grafting tomatoes. They'll take a tomato rootstock and graft a different plant on top of it. 
for various reasons. But uh, anyway, so that's. So if you didn't have a backyard to start your plant, if you had both and you only make started to grow, you could transform it into another pot maybe on your front porch or your back porch? A absolutely, absolutely. This plant was about this size. Uh, I think I potted this on a couple weeks ago into this larger pot. And this one could even probably go into a larger pot. If you want to grow a tomato in a container, I would suggest something around the 12-inch size. So, because they, 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 they can be big plants and they like a lot of room to stretch out. So, planting out. That's all I have to say about that. So you've got your garden, you have your plants growing. The next P on the list was pruning. Uh, Sarah wanted me to talk about pruning. And really the only plant, short of, short of uh, trees, the only plant in your garden that can benefit pruning are tomatoes. And it's kind of an interesting thing, you can do interesting things with pruning tomatoes. So I thought it would be worth to talk about that a little bit here with this plant. Can, can everyone see this OK? <laughs> How are we going to do this? With a tomato plant, the tomato plant has the main stem, and it sends out branches. And then at this point, where the branch meets the main stem, it'll send off what we call suckers. At each point here, they'll come off and send out these little suckers. And these will have branches. And then at that point, they can send out suckers. And if you let a plant, tomato plant like that just grow, it'll be a big, bushy tomato plant. It can be cumbersome to deal with a plant like that. You can have problems with air circulation around the plant, which would encourage disease. You're offering more places for pests to hide. And you're preventing sunlight from reaching into the core of the plant and ripening the fruit. So if you've ever grown tomatoes in cages, this is kind of, you know, you can imagine a cage around all this, you know, with this dense cone of tomato foliage in it. And it's difficult to harvest, too. It's difficult to dig in there and find the tomatoes. Tomatoes need support anyway. Uh, tomatoes are big, shaggy plants. So you can. So one way to deal with that is to stake them. You know, you put a. You've got your tomato plant. And you put a stake behind it. Now you may be asking, how do you get this big shaggy plant to train up that spindly little stake? And the answer is through pruning it. So what you'll do is you'll go take any kind of really almost any tool we'll use. Here's a pair of uh, sort of traditional Asian uh, Chinese scissors, which are kind of cool. I've got a pair of floral snips that I use on the farm an awful lot, so much so I, I even have my own holster for it. Uh, one of my favorite garden tools are these kitchen shears. Seriously, from just the cheapest knife set I had one time, but the shears are pretty handy. Um, it's a really it's a tool I use almost all the time uh, for, for, for pruning and, and harvesting. About, every, about once a week or so, you want to go through your plant and just cut off those, uh, those suckers. Let's see. Can set it up here? Will that work? Is this better? So, so here's the main stem. Here's the branch. Right here in the, in the crotch is this little sucker. We'll just snip him out. And then here's another one. And then here's another one right here. And it's getting kind of big, and it's, it's getting hard to tell the difference between the sucker and the stem. But you kind of look to see where the branch is, and you can find it. We'll cut him out. Here's another one. And here's a little tiny one. We'll just pinch him out right there. And here's another one. So, now what I've done is, 
opened up the structure of the plant. Well, I've given myself a main stem that I can attach to the stake. And it's going to make staking this tomato a lot easier. The other thing I've done is opening up the structure of the plant, there's all kinds of air circulation that can now get around this plant. And so long as I don't crowd it with its neighbors, that will help it resist, it will help disease and fungus, fu especially funguses, fung fungal diseases from attacking the plant because there's more air circulation that's a little drier around there. And then when this plant begins to blossom and set fruit, sunlight's going to be able to come in and reach that fruit and ripen it more easily. And then when you go to harvest it, it'll just be this neat, wonderful little plant uh, to harvest from. One other thing that pruning does is that it concentrates the energy of the plant kind of where you want it. When it's shooting off all these suckers, it's creating this growth and it's putting energy into this extra growth that we really don't need and is causing us trouble. Keeping it pruned like this focuses the energy into this main stem and into fruit production, which is where you want it. Then finally, say you have a, I don't know, a six foot tall steak. Um, this, is, this plant is a sun gold cherry tomato, same variety as this one. It's going to grow tall. Um, if the growing season were longer, I mean, it would continue to grow. We sometimes will grow these in greenhouses, and they'll grow 10 feet tall. Um, if you kind of get to the top of your stake and you don't know what to do, you can just, I won't do it to this plant because we're not ready to yet, but you just sort of cut the top off of the stem, and it will stop adding height to the plant. The fruit that remains, it'll continue to put energy into the fruit. That fruit will ripen. Um, but then when that fruit is done, it's done, which should be right about when you're done. Because there's a point in gardening, especially when you're eating seasonally, you know, you have your fresh tomatoes and it's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. There's a point in the season when you're like, I'm kind of done with tomatoes right now. Um, and that's, you can be done and that's okay. Basil, herbs. Now this really isn't pruning so much as an aspect of harvesting it. With most herbs and things uh, you want to not pick off just the leaves. Some people will just pick off the leaves. They're like, I need, some, I need some basil for dinner. You'll pinch off, you know, a couple leaves. Then their plants get really tall and spindly. And then they go to flower and they turn nasty and, and then they're done. And people come to the farmer's market and they say, what happened to my basil plant? I'm like, well, that's a harvesting issue. What you want to do is harvest at the stem level. So if you want, you know, four basil leaves here at the top, you're not going to pinch off the four leaves. You're going to snip it right here. Now you can see there's sort of a node here. There's two large leaves. And then there's another pair of another two leaves. And each of those two leaves is on a tiny little stem. So it's looking something like this. There's a leaf. And then it's kind of got this little mini stem going on here. And then this up here. If you snip it right here, these two stems will turn, will, will grow, and double the size of the plant. And they'll grow, and they'll look like, like it does up here on top, except there'll be two of them. And then you do that again, and you do that again. And you're always pinching it back. And you're always encouraging it to branch off. And if you do this consistently over the course of the season, the plant's going to get bushier and bushier. So instead of going straight up, being spindly, having a few leaves, it's going to be this nice, lush, full, bushy plant. It's going to have a bushy habit, is what we'd call it. Um, so that's how you do that. Not really pruning so much, but more, more of the harvesting. The other thing, if you do happen to see it start to flower, like at the top here, it'll put sort of like a little spike and It'll start having little tiny white flowers. You want to pinch that blossom off, pinch the top of that out. Because when herbs, by and large, when herbs start to flower, 
they're not as delicious as they used to be. Because the plant's putting energy not into foliage production, but into flower production. All of its energy is going to produce seeds. And so, therefore, the quality of the leaves is not as high as it was before it started to flower. At a certain point, it's going to do that anyway. You want to, we're really trying to postpone that as long as we can. But at a certain point, it's going to flower. And then, and then you're done. And that's great. And, you, and hopefully, it's September. And you're like, all right, I'm done with basil. That's, I'm OK with that. So planting, pruning, this doesn't start with this P, but uh, we talked a little bit about supporting, about plants that need support. Tomato is one. You can use stakes for that, which I recommend. If you have, to, if you have tomato cages, I would recommend that you use them to grow your peppers in, because peppers are kind of a big branchy plant. They're kind of awkward to stake. If you put all of that growth and it doesn't get as lush as a tomato cage, but if you, you use that tomato cage to support it, it will do really well. I tried that last year in my garden, and I had nice big plants with full fruit. It kept the fruit off the ground, which means the fruit didn't rot. The fruit was up in the air, so it ripened better. Uh, so tomato cages for peppers, really great. For tomatoes, not so much. If you're growing pole beans, you'll need some kind of pole to grow the beans up, obviously. If you have a bush-type bean, you can just leave them be on the ground. You can grow cucumbers up a trellis to save space. You can grow gourds up a trellis to save space. I've seen people try to grow melons up a trellis, although you need to find a way to support the fruit from the trellis because it'll just pull the plant down. So supporting is something to think about as we go through the season. Am I going to need some infrastructure in my garden to give these plants the growing conditions that they need? All right, protect. Now, this is the big one. And this is where the organic gardeners and the conventional gardeners part ways to a large degree. The theory behind organic gardening is that you're growing the healthiest plant you can. You're growing it in the healthiest soil you can. You're treating it as well as you can. And then it will therefore be stronger and more resistant to pests and to diseases. So the first step to protecting your plants is to grow the healthiest plants you can. You're adding fertilizer when you plant them out. Every couple of weeks, you're top dressing with fertilizing, with uh, compost. And what top dressing means is just take a scoop of soil and sprinkle it around the base of the plant, kind of work it in with your fingers. Um, your top dressing. You can use a fish emulsion diluted in water to feed the plant every so often. Uh, some things like basil, if you grow basil and if you pick it back often, if you're harvesting from it often, at a certain point in the season the leaves will start to yellow. They'll start to turn kind of a yellow green. It's not sick, it's just hungry because it's, it's exhausted the soil right where it is because it's been producing so many leaves and you've been harvesting it and you've been making caprese salad and pesto and tomato sauce. And so it needs, it needs a snack. It needs some more food. And so you can top dress with compost or fertilize it with fish emulsion. So the plants are really healthy. Weeding is part of protection. Weeds compete with the plants for light, water, and nutrients in the soil. Weeds can also be vectors. They can be trans trans They can transmit diseases and pests. They can be host plants for pests. They may, they may attract certain kinds of pests. So if you keep your garden clean, if you practice clean cultivation and keep the weeds out, you're reducing the avenues that disease and pests can get into your garden. Now for weeding, I mean, there's the old-fashioned sort of bending over and pulling weeds with your hands. You can also think about cultivation. And when we mean by cultivation is disturbing just the top layer of soil here. You've got little weeds growing here. You don't need to churn all of this up. You don't need to hack it all apart with a hoe. And in fact, if you do that, what you'll be doing is 
bringing more weed seeds deep in the soil to the surface of the soil where they can germinate and create more weeds. You just want to cultivate this top inch or so of soil. If you have a big area, you can use what's called a collinear hoe. I didn't bring one with me because it's a big tool and I had my arms full. But if you go to a catalog like Johnny's Seeds, Johnny's Selected Seeds, which is a great resource. If Johnny's doesn't have it, you probably don't need it. Um, but it's, it's not a hoe where you sit and hack at the ground. It's a hoe with a thin blade. And when you stand up and grasp the hoe like this, the blade is going to be parallel to the ground. And you just run that blade right in that top inch of soil, disturbing that top layer of weeds. You do this on a bright sunny day, disturb the weeds, the weeds wither in the sun, and you're done. Um, and if you keep at them when they're small, uh, you avoid a big weeding project later on. I brought some hand weeders that are kind of the same principle. This is a, a hand weeder with sort of a bar with two edges on it. And you'll just do the same thing. Run that under the top edge of the soil to disturb the weeds. Here's another one. It's got a nice sharp point. If you're careful, you can work right up, right up to the base of the plant to get the weeds that are growing right underneath it. Mulch is another great thing. If you collect your, your grass clippings for your lawn, for example, and you don't apply broad spectrum herbicides and pesticides to your lawn, you can take those grass clippings and put a couple inch layer of mulch in your garden beds around your plants and it will smother the weeds and prevent them from germinating and growing. So weeding, cultivating, mulching. Try not to spread broad spectrum herbicides and pesticides. Try not to spray things that are going to kill everything because they'll kill everything. Uh, if you spray certain weed killers on a windy day, it'll blow onto your garden plants and kill them. And that will be sad. Um, if you spray broad spectrum insecticides and pesticides, you're not only killing your pests, you're also killing beneficial insects. Um, not all bugs in the garden are bad. There are some you want to be there. There are some that eat the things that are eating your vegetables. These bugs are your friends, and you want to invite them in, and you want to not kill them when they're there. Uh, in the greenhouses, we actually purchase predatory beneficial insects from a, from a major supplier because we're sort of in an artificial environment, and so we need to introduce insects. So if we have a problem with aphids, we'll buy a pound of ladybugs. We'll get a pound of ladybugs in the mail, which is awesome. And we'll distribute them throughout the uh, greenhouses, and they'll feast on the aphids. There's a parasitic wasp that uh, will lay its eggs on aphids. And when the eggs hatch, they burrow into the aphid and eat it. There are lace wings which prey on insects. There are a whole host of things that eat the things that are eating your food. Now, you can, I mean, there are places where you can buy these things. Uh, I've seen them for sale in Gardener's Supply catalog, I think but it's easier for you to create the conditions in your garden that are going to invite beneficial insects and make it a nice home for them. Part of that is what part of companion planting is. I've handed out a guide on companion planting. Companion planting is a, is a traditional way of growing things together that help each other out. Maybe these are plants that have a beneficial effect on each other. Basil and tomato have a beneficial effect on each other. They encourage each other, other's growth. Some of them actually repel pests. If you grow borage near your tomato plants, you will not be afflicted with tomato hornworm because borage repels it. Borage is a, it's a lovely little blue edible flower um, that you should look into. Nasturtiums, if you plant them around your cucumbers, your melons, and your squash, it will repel squash bugs uh, because they don't like something about that plant. And then there are plants that attract beneficial insects. Uh, calendula is one. Many native plants attract them. Yarrow attracts beneficial insects. Queen Anne's lace. If you let your fennel go to seed, those tiny flowers will attract beneficial insects. If you let your dill flower, that will attract beneficial insects. Uh, so you're just inviting all of these good bugs into your garden to help keep the population of bad bugs down. 
Another thing that might happen when you spray pesticides is that it might kill all, it'll kill everything. It'll kill the bad bugs except for a couple. And those couple bugs you didn't kill are resistant to the spray you just sprayed. And then those bugs are going to mate and they're going to create a family of pesticide resistant bugs. I mean, this is, this is happening now. Um, it's happening to weeds too. There, a year ago, there was a whole problem with, uh, I forget which weed it was, but it had become resistant to Roundup. And Roundup, I'm sure you've seen commercials for it on TV, is a popular herbicide used in commercial farming. They spray it everywhere. They've genetically modified crops to be resistant to Roundup. And now they're finding the weeds. They sprayed it so much that the weeds are becoming resistant to Roundup. So long term, you can create systemic problems with indiscriminate use of pesticides and herbicides. That said, sometimes you do need to spray. I mean, sometimes you may have a plague, and it's a choice between having your plants to all die or spraying something. You can spray something. Uh, I brought a couple samples here. One is insecticidal soap, multipurpose insect control. This is a this is a fairly decent uh, organic product. It can be used for organic gardening. Um, it doesn't leave a residue on your vegetables. It controls a whole host of soft-bodied insects, aphids. I bought this because I had an aphid problem that I wasn't patient with, so I bought this and sprayed it once and killed everything, knocked the population down. So insecticidal soap is one. Uh, Copper fungicide, liquid copper fungicide is another. Um, I actually got this from Johnny's. I bought this from Fruit Basket Flower Land, which has a, a pretty good selection of organic products. Johnny's has a good selection of organic problem, products. This is copper fungicide. It controls powdery mildew, black spot, rust. I bought this to combat late blight in my garden. Uh, powdery mildew is something that'll affect cucumbers and squash. So. So it's a fairly decent product. You want to want to use, you know, be common sense. Wear some eye protection. Uh, you might want to wear a pair of. I don't think you need to wear a pair of gloves, but you could wear a pair of gloves so to apply it. Don't apply it the day you're going to be harvesting things. You know, you may want to make sure you rinse off your food before you eat it if you if you spray this. But it's, you know, sometimes you have to do it. So when you do it, you do it. You know, do it. Do, do it focused, use the least damaging product you can, use it only when you need it, uh, and use it right where you need it. Do you need that when you do the like that powdering? Yeah. Powder? Yep. That's when you use That's it. when you use it. Yeah. Do you usually say to get it? I, you, I would have to read the labels. <laughs> read the labels carefully. Um, some of them have important information. All right, specific pests. How am I doing on time? Just a little bit here. Specific tests, pests. If you have trouble with birds, get some bird netting. Um, you, can, you can buy a, a lightweight net mesh that you can cover with. You can cover your plants, or you can cover the affected plants to keep the birds off of them. Uh, some people will take aluminum pie pans and hang them up, and they'll spin in the light and frighten away the birds. Uh, you can buy giant beach balls with giant eyes on them. They're called scare balls, you know, um, and that's supposed to keep them away. You can get predator decoys, you know, big plastic owl that you put in your garden. It may keep the birds away. Squirrels and rabbits. Squirrels are my big pest in my urban garden. And I didn't bring any, but the best thing for squirrels and deer, or squirrels and rabbits are cayenne pepper. Get the biggest. You know, go to Costco or something, get a big thing of cayenne pepper. And if you have trouble keeping squirrels away, sprinkle that on the ground. Um, and it's worked well for me. There's a homebrew recipe for a spray, a cayenne pepper spray, on the hand out there. And that's just adding a little bit of, is it dish soap. Add a little bit of dish soap to that, and that helps the cayenne pepper adhere to the plant. Uh, makes it sticky. You do have to reapply this after it rains. The rain will wash it away. But it's, if you have a problem with squirrels and rabbits, that's a nice 
non-invasive way to start. Cats. The other problem I have in my garden, I have a problem with squirrels and I have a problem with cats. And the problem I have is feral cats going to the bathroom in my garden and it makes me crazy. Uh, so I'm looking into ways to combat that. I've read that spreading used coffee grounds, like if the cat is using a particular, particular part of your garden as a litter box, scatter used coffee grounds there. Uh, I've also read that if you plant marigolds, and this is back in the companion planting sort of column, that marigolds, this real s smelly, one, real fragrant marigolds, will repel cats because they don't like the fragrance. Another problem you might have is children. Um, <laughs> you know, some people and some people worry about kids getting into the garden, uh, causing havoc uh, in the garden. And I think the best thing for children is to welcome them and mentor them. Um, that's what I try to do. Like we have neighborhood kids, and they come by, and they like to go through the garden and kind of welcome them and mentor them and sort of get them interested in gardening perhaps. You know, you can teach them. So you see that as a teachable moment, not a inconvenient moment. For tomatoes, one common pest is the tomato hornworm, which is a big, fat, green caterpillar. Um, the best way to, comp to combat that, short of repelling it with borage, is you, you pick them off and you squish them. This is <laughs> Mechanical insect control, um, and it works for a lot of things. Uh, Mex you know, with beans, I know someone who has a problem with Mexican bean beetles, and they go out in the morning and they pick them off the plant, uh, put them in a little jar of water with some olive oil in it to break the surface tension and drown them. Uh, that's a way to deal with pests, is to, to pick them off and squish them. Um, and if you're squeamish, you just need to get over that. It's <laughs> Aphids is another problem. Aphids are too small to go and pick off, so the insecticidal soap is an option. Uh, inviting ladybugs into your garden through companion planting is a way to help that. Cutworms can be another problem for tomatoes, and I'm, I'm sort of focusing on tomato pests. Uh, but you know, you sort of go through the A to Z guide, and you can see what pests bother a plant, and, and the guide will give you ways to deal with the pests, which will be variants on these themes. The tomato cutworm is a little caterpillar that lives in the ground and burrows up to the stem of the plant, nibbles it enough for it to fall over. So if you have a beautiful, healthy plant, and then suddenly one day it falls over dead, look at the stem and see if it's been gnawed on. Search around in the soil. They're little, little, they're about inch long gray caterpillars, and they're called cutworms. If you have a problem with that in your garden, um, there's a physical, you know, physically preventing pests from reaching your plant is kind of a method. You would take a toilet paper roll, and when the plant is small, sort of stick it into the soil. We'll use this example here. Have it be an inch underneath the soil, and it's this little collar around the base of your plant which will prevent the cutworms from burrowing up and eating your plant. Blights and mildews, I talked a little bit about pruning for air circulation and the copper fungicide. So you get through the growing season, you've planted, you've protected, you've trellised and pruned, and the tomatoes are there and they're red and they're ready to harvest, you just pick them. Um, the, uh, for picking tomatoes, when we, when we tell some of the, the crew at the farm, it's easy to grasp the tomato. You kind of roll it off the stem. Don't, don't, don't reef on it necessarily, but you can just kind of gently roll it off. Uh, if it's stubborn, you know, I'll use my kitchen shears and just snip it off. We were talking a little earlier before the class about heirloom tomatoes. You get all these great multicolored tomatoes. And the question was, how do you know when it's ripe? If you're used to a red tomato that turns red and you pick it when it's red, uh, how do you know when a green tomato is ready? Well, with those, you kind of have to go by feel. Through experience, you'll know what an heirloom, what a ripe green tomato looks like. But if you feel it and it feels, you know, if you, you know what a green tomato feels like, it's hard, rock hard. You know, if it's got that nice little give to it of a nice ripe tomato, it's ready, you know. 
And the worst that happens is you try it and it's not quite ready. And so you sort of taste your way through it and let your taste be your guide about your experience and learning when to pick these things. I talked a little bit about how to harvest basil. Uh, for picking most, you know, picking most things is as simple as that, picking it or snipping it off with a pair of shears if it's stubborn. The, the thing to remember is to not, you know, beans are, are an example of this where you maybe need to do it two-handed, use one hand to hold the plant and another hand to pick the bean. You don't want to just reef on the fruit and damage the plant is the thing to watch out for. I've included a couple recipes. Um, at the farm, we like to always not only tell people you know, how to grow things, but also how to you know, give them suggestions on how to cook them. So I've included some, some of my favorite tomato and basil recipes. Uh, the cherry tomatoes with pasta is a really easy thing to do, especially if you, get, uh, if you grow a number of tomato plants and you grow a, a red one, an orange one, a green one, a pink one, you know, the different heirloom varieties, and you slice those up and mix them all together. Visually, it looks great. In terms of flavor, it tastes better. Um, but it's just mixing that with some garlic, some olive oil, some fresh basil, and tossing it with hot pasta. Easy, easy, easy. And then for preserving, on the, on the back, there's a couple ways to preserve it. That's another really satisfying thing to do with your garden, is to put, put food up, as they used to say. I do a lot of freezing at my house because it's, because canning is a whole other thing. Freezing is really easy. Uh, the roasted tomato recipe is a fabulous way to, uh, to preserve tomatoes for freezing. You just bake them down into these nice little almost sun-dried looking tomato things and put the whole baking sheet in the oven, or in the oven. Once it's done, you put the baking sheet in the freezer, freeze them in place like that, and you can just put them in a zip top bag and pull out as many as you need throughout the winter time. Pesto for basil is easy to freeze. Um, if you're gonna do a lot of it, we have a dedicated ice cube tray that we use for freezing herbs. Um, some herbs that you mix with oil, like, pest, like for pesto and freeze it that way. Some herbs you can chop up, put in the ice cube trays, fill up with water and let freeze and you have sort of ice, ice cubes with herbs in it. You can crack those out of the trays and put them in a zip top bag and then all through the winter you can take a cube of thyme and put it in your soup that you're making or chives, put that in the soup that you're making. It's a great way to freeze and preserve herbs. That is, that is all I have. Are there any questions? Yes. A big container would be one. Actually, the first thing I should say, you should have a smaller tomato and a bigger container. Uh, for tomatoes, you want to look at, there are two kinds of tomatoes, indeterminate and determinate. That refers to how large it grows. A, an indeterminate tomato will grow as long as it lives. Its height is indeterminate. A determinate tomato will grow to a certain height, and then it will stop has a determinate height. Look for determinate varieties for your container gardening because they'll just be much easier to manage uh, in a container. You know, you get a big tall plant, it'll could tip over. <coughs> Putting a trellis on it or a stake on it could be difficult. And then, so small plant, big pot. Look for something in the 12 inch range, 12 to 14 would not be too large. They're gonna want a lot of soil. And then you definitely need to be prepared to fertilize. Because after about a month in that pot, it's, it will have used up all of the nutrition and will just sort of stop growing. So top dressing with compost, feeding with diluted fish emulsion once or twice a week. Taking your cues from the plant. If the foliage is starting to yellow, it needs more food. If the fruit production is slowing down, it needs more food. And then in the, in the heat of the summer, keep an eye on it water-wise, because containers will dry out quickly. You know, when it's July, when it's August, when it says 80, 90 
degree temperatures, that, that soil will just become a little adobe brick if you don't keep it moist. So, yes? Can watering the gardens better to not sprinkle or water? I'm glad you asked. Don't be this person, right? We've probably all seen this person standing out there with his hose for 15 minutes, sprays, sprays it for 15 minutes, and then walks away. And it's the worst way, it's the least effective way to water. These things are great for washing your car. They're not great for watering your garden. You want to think about being a rainstorm, being all day rain, not a cloudburst. You want to turn on a sprinkler, either like a fan sprinkler or an oscillating sprinkler and water it for a couple hours. Maybe do it right in the evening um, or first thing in the morning. But you want to just get the ground thoroughly saturated. You don't want to just have that top couple inches wet. You want it to be wet deep into the soil. So it doesn't hurt to plant? Like that, that doesn't cause that fungus on the vegetable? Sometimes it can. And if you're concerned about that, soaker hoses are a great option. Okay. You know, to, to, to put this, keep the foliage dry but be able to get the soil moist. Okay. Yeah. But if you, do, if you do frequent short waterings, you're only getting that top couple inches wet, and so that's the only place the plant's going to put roots. And then if you forget to do it, the plant will be in trouble. So water deeply, the plants will put down deep root, and then if we do go through a dry spell, it's going to be able to, to weather that longer and better. Hmm? I believe you can. A lot of people swear by that. Um, some people get concerned about the chlorine in city water. So having a rain barrel is a very, it's a very green thing to do. Um, you had Cody as your question. Yes. Can you tell me, um, you sell your uh, plants there also, or are you just at the farmer's market? We sell mainly at the Fulton Street Farmer's Market. Uh, I think it's booth 30 every Saturday morning through like Father's Day. So, and we sell three inch, three inch pots of anything you could want, really. So, Which farmer's market did you say? Fulton Street Farmer's Market. Do you recommend newspaper for mulch? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, yes. <laughs> I, don't have a very, I don't have a very big garden, but so. Newspaper, cardboard. Okay. Um, newspaper and cardboard work really well in conjunction with other mulches. Okay. If you put down five sheets of newspaper and then an inch of mulch, that's a great weed barrier. Okay. Um, it's a great way to kill a lawn in preparation for garden the next, the next year. In the fall, lay down a five sheet thick layer of newspaper, put a, maybe a couple inches of compost, put a couple, three inches of wood chips over top of it. Over the winter, that'll all break down and it'll be ready to plant in the spring and you don't have to shovel your turf out, which is a pain. Thank you.